good afternoon and thank you uh, for attending today's program. I am Valerie McCall and I'm chair of the American Public Transportation Association and a member of the Board of Trustees for the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority. Uh, we are pleased today to unveil new research to help us understand the rapidly evolving mobility worldwide. Um, before I go further, I'd like to introduce Doran Barnes, who's the Vice Chair of AFTA in here as well. The report is titled, Shared Mobility and the Transportation of Public Transportation. Our format today will be to discuss the report, its findings, and its recommendations. We will then hear the perspectives of AFTA, Uber, and Lyft, and the perspective of a transit agency, the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority. I will introduce our four speakers, and they will come forward one at a time to make their presentations. When the four panelists have completed their presentations, we would like to have a thoughtful discussion. So as you are listening, please begin to get your questions ready so we can have a nice discussion afterwards. First, to present the findings and recommendations of the new report is AFTA President and CEO Michael Malanafi. Michael has spent his entire career in public transportation with more than 26 years of both public and private sector leadership. He has run transit systems in Charlotte, uh, Laredo, Hamilton, Ohio. Uh, Michael, please take it over. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. I'm Michael Laffey, President and CEO of APTA, and we are very excited to be with you to share the results of the shared mobility uh, report. This is a fantastic report. We're very excited to be bringing this to you today. It's the first of its kind research examining ride-sharing services and its relationship to public transportation. It has an emphasis on seven cities for the study. And the cities were Austin, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, and here in D.C. I'd also like to recognize Diane Schwager, who has joined us here. She's the Senior Program Officer of the Transportation Research Board. And she was invaluable in giving us guidance to complete the study. And sitting next to her there is Sharon Fagan. Sharon is the Executive Director of the Shared Use Mobility Center. Thank you both so much for the tremendous amount of effort you all put into making the study. And Darnell Grisby, we to run this program out of APTA's uh, policy office as well, Director of Research at APTA. I also want to uh, acknowledge Carol Warner. Uh, Carol and her wonderful team at the Environmental and Environmental Energy Study Institute, who have again partnered with us in pulling this event together. Thank you so very much. We truly value your partnership. Ride sharing has emerged as a critical element in our industry. It helps the public transportation customer with the first and the last mile in the public transportation network. Today, I'm going to highlight three of the main findings of the report. First, as we look at the travel habits of 4,500 people in the seven cities, we found that people use shared modes or ride sourcing, such as Uber and Lyft, the more likely that they were to use public transit. They own frequent, they own fewer cars, and they spend less money on transportation. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? In fact, among those that use Lyft and Uber, 50% said they use a train, and 45% said they also use a bus. Approximately 57% of frequent shared users said public bus or train was the single shared mode they use most often, followed by bike sharing, ride sourcing, and car sharing. This means public, public transit is the anchor or the go-to mobility choice for those who lead a multimodal lifestyle. People who use public transportation and other shared modes drive less, walk more, and save on transportation costs. You can't beat that. An example of the savings can be seen when you compare people who have used any of the shared modes beyond public transit to those who are experimenting with new forms of shared mobility. Statistically, they own nearly half a car less. So the average household doesn't use shared mobility 1.5 cars, those that are using shared mobility 1.05 cars, and basically half a car less. Using a combination of public transit and ride sharing may lead to better health. Almost half of all respondents say that they are more physically active since they started using shared mobility. So you may actually get a better body as a result of ride sourcing in conjunction with public transit. It's all right. So do you like saving money? Of course, this is, this is a significant impact on household incomes. For those who combine riding public transit with ride sourcing, 20% of those surveyed said they postponed buying a car. 18% decided to 
not going to car at all. And 21% sold it and did not replace it. It's an incredible statistic. Buying a vehicle and maintaining it tends to be the second greatest household investment. This expense is second only to buying and maintaining your home. The second important finding I'd like to discuss is that shared modes are a complement to public transportation. This enhances the entire mobility network. We saw this very consistent, compelling data that was prevalent in every city that we studied. We found there was a clear peak in ride sourcing demand between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. on weekends. This is the time of greatest demand overall, and public transit is often unavailable to the result. This means ride sourcing does not compete directly with public transportation, where they're complements to the entire mobility network. As an added bonus, furthermore, 54% of respondents indicated they use ride sourcing as a recreational or social trip purpose within the last three months, which results in fewer drunk drivers on the road. This is very good. The third finding I'd like to highlight from the report is a strong recommendation that the industry was already embracing. As shared modes continue to grow in significance, public transportation entities should work together with these car sharing, car sharing services to ensure that benefits are widely and equitably shared. A number of our public transit agencies have seized the opportunity to improve effectiveness of urban mobility for all users through our collaboration and public-private partnerships with the shared modes. I believe this is proof positive that our industry is agile, adaptable, and many times ahead of the curve when it comes to embracing and leveraging new technologies. And sitting at the end of the table here is Brad Miller. Brad is the CEO of the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority, serving St. Pete, Clearwater, and surrounding communities. He's going to speak later. He's going to share with you a great example of how public transit agencies are making these public-private partnerships work. So, Brad, thank you so much for coming up today. We really appreciate it. We're finding that our public sector agencies and private mobility operators are eager to collaborate to particularly improve paratransit using emerging technologies and innovations. These new individual technologies developed for shared use mobility can be folded into paratransit operations as well as existing fixed routes. This is important. I just touched on a few of the highlights, but I urge everyone to take a look at the report with these groundbreaking findings and recommendations. We have copies here in the room, or you can go to our, our website, APTA.com. The way people get around communities is being transformed, and public transit is at the heart of that formal shift. Together with companies like Uber and Lyft, we are integral to creating a dynamic, multimodal lifestyle. So thank you so much, and look forward to having a great, active discussion with this incredible panel. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So next we will hear from Uber's Transportation and Mobility Policy Manager. Andrew Salzberg. Andrew focuses on making Uber an integral part of the future of urban transportation through research, partnership, and policy development. He joined Uber in 2013 and became the senior operations manager for New York City. You've been busy. Uber's largest global market before joining the global policy team. Prior to joining Uber, Andrew worked at the World Bank supporting public transportation investment projects on East Asia. Thank you. Yeah, so as that intro alludes to, I think this is kind of like a, a homecoming for me in a lot of ways. I was at the World Bank in D.C. for several years. And kind of the beginning of my career was very focused on making public transportation investments kind of abroad, but the, the big picture was how to make those as efficient and effective as possible. Um, and four years ago, or three years ago, when I decided to join Uber, I kind of did that because of what this report talks about, which is that I think high level, the goals that Uber is pursuing and the goals that public transport is pursuing are kind of one and the same. Right? We're looking to provide convenient, affordable, accessible, sustainable transportation for cities all across the U.S. and more broadly across the world. So I think what's really exciting for me today is to have this report come out, you know, sponsored by Apto and the people in the room, to kind of put some meat behind that thesis that this is really what is happening on the ground and we're hearing that directly uh, from riders. So you know, we've talked a lot at Uber about how we believe in this report that goes that Uber and public transportation are companies. Um, I'm based in New York, so one of the ways when I first joined, um, I was looking at a map of kind of where people request rides. And you can literally do a pretty good job, uh, job of mapping commuter rail lines out of New York just by looking at where ride requests happen. 
because people are sort of trying to time their request to get the Uber waiting for them when they get off of the or train or whatever it is. Um, so you can see some people are more or less successful with how it kind of soon uh, before the station the request. But that obviously is someone trying to kind of play a game um, to sort of time that connection. So if we make that easier, we kind of go out of our way to, to make that less of a guessing game and more of a seamless connection. Um, it also illustrates, I think, that the riders were kind of leaving us in some ways by making those connections. Right? People figured out that Uber was a good way to get to and from a commuter rail station long before we were kind of thinking of promoting and formalizing that connection. Um, and this report, I think, recognizes the leadership of just people on the ground, these riders are making these informed decisions um, about the complementary of Uber and Lyft um, and then public transport operations all around the country. What I think is particularly exciting about this report is it talks about a kind of different sort of, sort of complementary this, this issue that uh, Michael alluded to with the time of day complementarity, right? I live in New York and I get a lot of free Uber credit, but I still take the subway every morning because it's faster and more convenient for me. Um, but when I'm out at night on the weekend, um, I tend to take Uber at one point and please support the somebody. Um, and I think having those two options makes it more and more possible to live in a car, which is what some of the data from the report alludes to. You know, I think this is another reason that this is a good study for me. I got my driver's license when I was 28. I grew up in Canada. I never owned a car. And I think I was frequently mocked by my American friends, but now I'm a little bit on the vanguard instead of on the show. So, like, if this report could help me make make me seem kind of cool in some weird way, that's that's a positive byproduct. But I think really broadly, there's lots of data showing that the driver's license uh, kind of rates are going down across the board for you know quote unquote millennials, which I just barely part of the definition, which is exciting. And I think a lot of that is the smartphone and what that enables. Um, so, you know, I think the evidence is accumulating in this report does a great job, I think, better than we've seen before of laying that out. And the final piece that I think is, is exciting um, is kind of taking the pulse of the enthusiasm of uh, public transit agencies of working with companies like ours, because I think we've had that enthusiasm for quite a while. Um, so to see that on the other side is super important. We've got partnerships uh, with folks like Brad, who's going to talk about in more detail. Um, previously, you know, uh, Marta and Dart, the leaders in the space, um, we've done kind of one-off partnerships with folks like Caltrain, where you know supply was going to be crunched for the Super Bowl, so can we use Uber Pool to kind of help alleviate uh, supply uh, sort of shortages at peak times? And then finally, I think we've, we've got some interesting partnerships that are building off the API that we put out about a year ago that allows third-party developers to kind of build the best answer to that problem that I was discussing with with commuter rail lines in New York. Can somebody build a better option to kind of make that journey smooth? Right? It doesn't have to be us. It doesn't have to be a transit agency app. They're publishing open data. We have an open API. Maybe someone in the basement has the best answer for how this to fit together. And that's what's pretty exciting about the future. So I think you know, we have teams. I was on the New York team for a long time. As you mentioned, there's teams all across the country who are managing cities and states for us trying to figure out the best solutions for their local market, much, I think, in the same way that transit GMs all across the country are trying to do the same. And so if this report helps to kind of lay the groundwork for how those folks will get better, then I'm super excited about it. Next up, we have Emily Castor, Director of Transportation Policy for Lyft. Um, she's a member of the original Lyft team. Emily works with researchers, transportation planners, and environmental advocates and transit agencies to advance ride sharing as a sustainable transportation option and documents its impacts. She started her career as a transportation policy aide for a U.S. Congresswoman and later served as a financial advisor for municipal infrastructure projects. So, Emily, thank you for being here. Much. Yeah, it's really great to be here, and I think, you know, in, in many ways to see this day as a culmination of what has been an outpouring of enthusiasm on both sides, like the private industry side and the public transit sector over the last year, as our, our new services have been maturing and transit systems have been adopting technology and learning about what's available, and now that's really starting to gel in an incredible opportunity for partnerships and collaboration. So um, just to give you a little background on Lyft um, for, you know, and how we've come to this uh, relationship with public transit, our founder, Logan Green, actually started out his career as an advocate for bus riders in Southern California. He lived in Santa Barbara, he didn't have a car, and he was a transit-independent individual. And so 
he um, became a, a, an appointee to the transit board there and was all of a sudden, <coughs> in, you know, instead of having to just be an advocate, was stuck with the responsibility that you all are so familiar with of learning you know, how to provide service in areas where it's, it's very difficult to achieve the ridership that you may need to get a 40-foot bus to be cost-effective on a route and um, you know, have a, um, a you know, ability to provide service frequently enough for it to be convenient for folks. He was at the crux of that challenge and he thought, why don't we use technology and the existing personal vehicle assets that are already out there being driven by everyday people every day to, um, you know, to tap into that asset and augment the transit network in a way that can expand mobility for people in these communities so that people don't need to own cars. And so that was the, the seed of an idea, um, inspired even by the organic kinds of transit networks that, that pop up in places like Zimbabwe, where we have traveled and seen you know, these sort of jitneys that, that have moved around, and there have been examples of things like that in the past in the United States as well. But what has changed is the advent of this technology that allows us to create accountability around that system and to provide a user experience that's really convenient and easy and trusted for folks. And so as we've seen that network build to the point where it truly has the critical mass and the reliability to provide a service, um, oftentimes, you know, with three minute wait times, even in suburban areas where, um, you know, that may be very difficult to serve with traditional transit, we've started to see these discussions come together where transit agencies are reaching out to us and saying, here are the, the gaps that we have in our system that we think that a service like Lyft might be able to fill. And so we've listened in those discussions and asked for, for ideas, for suggestions, and frankly just been incredibly impressed by the energy and enthusiasm uh, from the transit industry about embracing this kind of innovation and using it to, to transform the, the nature of transit service delivery. And I think in the, the future that we're entering now is one in which we can be so much more tailored in the way that we deliver service, where you know, there, there will always be a role for high capacity fixed route transit. People love the experience of taking rail. This morning I, I took the metro from the hotel where I was staying in Virginia to come into, um, into DC. I didn't have to sit in traffic. I was able to just walk to the station. That's a wonderful experience that everyone will always want to have. Um, but you know, for those folks who are living out in suburban communities who aren't quite close enough to that fixed route, who have that first and last mile gap, or even in suburban and rural communities where there's not that kind of accessibility of high capacity transit, um, and even folks who aren't you know, able to afford or able to physically drive a vehicle, we think that by working together we can fill some of those gaps and expand mobility for all. So we've been very actively engaged with many different transit agencies. Um, some of you I even see in the room over the last several months. Um, we've announced partnerships with DART, with uh, cities in Los Angeles and Denver that are working to integrate our technology into their multimodal trip planning apps so that we can start to present a really seamless experience for our customers, where instead of just having to open up this app to get this ride and this other app to get that other ride, we can help ask Siri. <laughs> she anticipates my every need. Um, we, can, you know, we can make that connection easier the way Andrew was describing where folks don't have to, to be thinking about timing those connections. We can use technology um, and our API integrations as long as transit itself is starting to adopt technology like mobile ticketing apps for your smartphone-based fare collection. Uh, we can make those interoperable with one another and we can develop really interesting service models for low density areas where we may be able to save transit agencies money while getting people picked up faster and getting them to work faster than they were able to get places before. So we're excited to be here and really commend the work of the Shared Use Mobility Center, TCRP, and APTA in working on this because um, what's answered in this report are so many of the questions that people have been asking me for the last year. They said, okay, great. You know, Lyft is, is doing this cool thing. We see some of your organic you know, activity that's happening on your platform around first and last mile rides, but what were people doing before? What did they do before they got in that Lyft car or after they got out? And we didn't know the answer to that. And this study really helps answer those questions and shows how the combination of these services will be a catalytic effect in reducing the need for car ownership. So uh, thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Um, and I just want to point out that those of us that are transit board members, what you heard her say that the founder of Lyft actually was a transit board member. So again, that brings it home, I believe, as to why this is important. Um, and to round us up here is we have uh, Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority CEO, Brad Miller. PSTA operates a fleet of 210 buses on 40 routes serving St. Peter, Petersburg, Clearwater, and surrounding communities. Before taking leadership of PSTA in 2011, uh, Brad headed the Des Moines Area Regional Transit Authority in Des Moines, Iowa. He, serving, um, he served the Virginia Railway Express in the Washington, D.C. area 
and was the Chief Operating Officer of the Charlotte Area Transit System in North Carolina. Um, Brad, please share with us your friends. Thank you, Valerie. Good afternoon, everyone from the sunny state of Florida. I'm very honored to be here, and I'm very grateful for these partners that are up here that we could not have implemented our pilot program about a month ago without. Certainly with APTA, Michael and Valerie uh, supporting us on the national level, our partnership with Uber that I'll talk about just in a second, and now when I get back to Florida tonight, then it'll be with Lyft. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're here today celebrating uh, the future of transportation, I strongly believe, and I think it's a great, great uh, partnership and collaboration that we can enhance mobility for everyone. That's our job as local transit uh, providers is get people, real people, uh, mobility in any way we possibly can. I know our pilot program in its only third week of uh, existence is already showing the results that Michael talked about in the report about that this is a complement to our existing public transportation system. I do want to thank um, some folks that we could not have done, gotten this done without. Certainly uh, our friends at Uber have been working very diligent with us and you know, experimenting with us along the way as we plan this uh, program. I need to thank my uh, my board members, my local elected officials, including the chair of my board who's in the audience, Ms. Darden Rice, a city councilwoman from St. Petersburg, and a number of key um, leaders in our Florida legislature. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion all over the country on these this disruptive technology, I think, as they like to say, and we've had some real great leaders in the legislature as well. So what we did on February 19th was we launched a what we believe is the first of its kind in the country first mile last mile partnership program with uber and taxi cabs so now in a portion of our community as of now it's just amazing technology uh if you are in, if you are anywhere in this city of pinellas park florida or part of st Petersburg, florida and you pull up the uber app there will be a pspa option um, and it'll say, basically, you, it's a cool little slider, and if you uh, take, select PSTA, and ride Uber, or, or the taxi cab works the same way, to a bus stop, you get a half price ride. So what that, in this zone, uh, with the average price, according to Uber, is about five or six dollar Uber ride, the average trip. So half price on that, plus our two dollar and 25 cent uh, transit fare, makes the total ride about, about $5. So far, it's already uh, increased. According to Uber, it's really increased uh, Uber patronage in this area, and it's actually helped our ridership. <coughs> we have a uh, low-income community on the on one side of our main, main line that this connects to, that they there's no sidewalk from their community to the main bus line, and they now have an option. <laughs> Some of them maybe don't have a smartphone yet, but they will get one, and uh, and so they can take the taxi cab option as an alternative. On the other side of the uh, north-south route, we have a new business that has just moved in with a, a number of young people, and they're also not really walkable to the main bus line, but they are now starting to take Uber. They're actually sharing the ride, and so at maybe $3 for the total trip, it's very inexpensive for them to connect to the to transit and get to where they need to go. <clears throat> it really is great for us to be the incubator of this program. It is a pilot program that I already consider to be a huge success, but we're gonna run it for six months and then expand it. As Michael said and some of the others said, I think it is a great opportunity. We're gonna try to uh, use these partnerships with our paratransit program to overlay the same kind of uh, service in a broader area so that it can maybe be an alternative for people with disabilities who, get, who uh, can take advantage of that. That saves my agency money and allows me to provide better service uh, on my main corridor routes. So again, thank you very much for inviting me. I think it's, I think it's a fantastic um, leap into the future for our whole transit industry and having you be part of it. Thank you.
Um, so as you all can see, this is it's more than just a study. It's collaboration at its finest. Um, and I don't want to lose sight of something. I didn't mention this earlier, but we have Uber and Lyft at the table working together with transit. And I think I heard you say Uber and taxi cabs working together as well. And so those are very, very critical and important distinctions, I think, because it really goes to show you that collaboration happens. At the end of the day, we all want to do what's best for our, for the writers and for the community. And here we have a great example of that. So I, I appreciate you sharing the example of what you're doing. Um, I'd love to hear more about that as well. You guys are making other transit agents I'm very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so with that, um, first of all, let's give them all a round of applause. Um, talk about how you integrated the back office functions and also um, what were the concerns of regarding proprietary uh, information and business plans. Yeah, so again, I mean, I'm, I don't know if I'm the right person to act. I think it is absolutely awesome, and I have no idea how it works. <laughs> 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 My understanding is essentially what uh, what the app does is it, it turns the lights on. <laughs> exactly. What I do? <laughs> it, 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 they create a geo fence around a certain area, so that um, when you, wherever you're standing, when you hold your phone, it knows that you are in the zone, and it gives you the PSPA option. And then there are zones around the bus stops for your destination, or if you get off at one, you can go anywhere uh, the other way as well. And what we've worked out with Uber is a an arrangement where essentially they're able to track the number of users of this and essentially charge us um, half price, mm -hmm. and then we get a bill at the end of the month. It really is very seamless. Um, we're, we're collecting data. Actually, Uber is much better than my own people about giving me tons of data and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. but I guess you know the systems that, that Brad mentioned the geofencing and the invoicing by uh we put my month are the kind of things that we're putting out making the easier to use the process. Some of the, the, the greater complexity around what you're referring to around back office is isn't something that has to happen in this kind of a partnership because there's that simple billing function. I think when you look at the inverse where you have um, a transit agency offering a mobile ticketing app and wanting to allow people to, you know, to process payment for a Lyft drive through that app, which is something that we're also exploring in a number of different places, um, then there, there are ways to process, to hand off that user's um, sort of payment request in such a way that it maintains the security of their information and, and also doesn't require um, too deep of, of an integration between our system and yours. There are a number of different ways to set that up that we're happy to explore with anyone, depending on what's the easiest for your technical system. But it can be as simple as monthly billing or as sophisticated as having, you know, adopting a, um, a, a technology integration that allows for back-end sort of um, payment to handoff. So, so can I ask, I'm sorry. Oh. Yes. Just to clarify, so the collection point is not the rider, it's the transit agency. So Uber and Lyft and this, which is not what Uber and Lyft are on, on other platforms, right? The rider still has an account in this case. Like it's behind the scenes where the payments are that. So the rider pays $3 up front, and that difference is billed. Mike's don't work for it. They're not working. So the rider has an account. And with pay, Uber? Yeah. Okay. And they'll pay the $3 fare. And then that difference in credit to mention is going kind to of feel in one of the installments. Okay. Yeah. okay. want to come over here, and then I'll, I'll get everyone. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, sir. <coughs> Sorry. Darren Lovas with the Natural Resources Defense Council. And, uh, it's great to see this new research. And, and the findings are quite rosy, <laughs> which is great. And I'm wondering if you also identified any challenges or problems that the transit industry and uh, the private sector companies need to tackle. Okay. I'm the first of them. The author? The author. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as soon as 
there's a question of an issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, um, so I, and what we did was we surveyed we surveyed users, and we understood what we understand more about behavior. Uh, we interviewed transit agencies, and we um, looked at data for trips. So we did, um, clearly there are lots of challenges in terms of, uh, you know, implementing this in the big picture, which actually I think are, are better equipped to, to talk about. But um, we saw a tremendous opportunity, especially on the paratransit side, for the integration and for actually saving agencies a lot of money. So it was a pretty rosy. Uh, Right. There are there are differences in terms of uh, yes, their requirements and things around um, who the drivers are. I mean things that you you know probably read about and heard about in terms of um, uh, FTA requirements and if you're going to integrate these things, how do you handle that? How do you, you know there are shifts in the way that uh, drivers uh, using individuals who are drivers instead of uh, professional drivers. So those are challenges. Yeah. Okay, Amanda Vandergrift at WSB Parsons Prakerhoff. Can you speak up just a little bit? Amanda Vandergrift at WSB Parsons Prakerhoff. Thank you for the discussion. I think it's very interesting. And I wanted to hear more about the pilot, because this really is one of the first of its kind. Um, did, was the pilot including, does it include paratransit in the pilot? And if so, how is that implementation going to occur with, with Uber? Uh, the pilot does not include our paratransit program. I mean, it's open to anyone, basically, who, who can use a taxi cab or an Uber vehicle to connect to our fixed route service. I think there are other examples around the country of folks that are testing out the overlay of these shared ride services with paratransit. And I think now that, we, now that we've shown a success and have this sort of partnership uh, Growing, we can we can do that as well. I have it here. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, how long has this pilot been uh, going on? What's the ridership changes that you're seeing on fixed road transit? And what was the other question? Let me see. And what about costs? Are your costs increasing? What are, What are you seeing? Okay, uh, so this program has been going since just February 19th, so... Okay, it's not that long. It's very successful. Uber has reported to me that Uber usage in this zone is up. And um, it's true transit? What about and, on, and on the fixed route transit, it is... I don't have as uh, real-time data on that. I have some information that... Uh, we are getting usage of the program that's growing each week, um, and I haven't really seen whether it's growing the entire route or, or what, but it, it, we are seeing each week we've seen increased numbers of folks that are using both the, both uh, Uber and the, and the taxi cab options we've been providing with us. Okay, I'm just, uh, I think I'm just curious to see if it's going to translate to more costs for your transit agency, and I guess we so, well, not over time. The, the cost, um, of course, is three dollars. Is, is up to three dollars or half the price, which is about three dollars per per trip that we're subsidizing. And uh, we actually believe this will be a cost, uh, more cost efficient option to some of these areas than running a certainly a fixed route bus or on a on a frequent basis. It's substantially less costly. For us, I think our average price on our paratransit uh, operations is um, well north of fifteen dollars a trip, and on our fixed route bus, it's maybe around three dollars a trip. So it's very comfortable. Uh, I've only had a chance to spend this very quickly. Uh, and it turns out, I'm pretty lucky that I'm doing a few by its Certainly the provision of paratransit service everywhere needs to be improved, and I would argue the provision of fixed route transit needs to be improved. I don't think this nascent partnership uh, is destined to improve either paratransit or fixed route. I have some specific questions. Uh, in skimming it, I didn't see any reference to the six or eight case study cities 
Uh, maybe that's in a separate report, or maybe it's online. Uh, I did see reference to the fact that Uber, uh, so I would say notoriously, but certainly traditionally, not really <coughs> forthcoming with uh, regulators. I think they know the word regulators, they recognize it. But with jurisdictions that want to inquire about some of its ride data, they've been unwilling to do, do so. so this suggests that they did so somewhat with the study authors. I'd be interested in knowing how forthcoming they were, and if anything that the study authors were interested in seeing uh, that were, were refused by Uber. And did Lyft also participate in the ride sharing data? Uh, so I would like to suggest that Uber's and Lyft's model, all such Uber's model, are to have uh, a floating, uh, uh, cruising a uh, cadre of drivers with vehicles serving in any service area they have. And I don't know that EESI itself would think that that's an environmentally sustainable, or hopefully an environmentally sustainable model to have vehicles uh, available and accessible to those people who don't require accessible vehicles on a regular basis. Some analysis of the way the ride sourcing entities uh, have their vehicles available for hire. That's what they are, they're available for hire, they're available for hire, they're available for hire. Some study of how that <coughs> is done that should be made by somebody, and I hope that you guys have a look at it. So I would like to give them an opportunity to find some pretty good questions in there. So. So I'll just chime in with respect to the environmental piece. I think you provided the perfect segue to mention another study that Darren Lovas is in the room from NRDC. Um, NRDC is currently conducting a study with funding from the Hewlett Foundation um, that in which both Uber and Lyft are participating, providing activity data as well as um, distribution of, of a survey instrument that is looking precisely at sort of that, that net environmental impact question. Um, it, will, it will assess the behavior patterns around using these services and also all of those different factors, you know, from the vehicles to the, the miles, the downtime in between rides that, um, that may impact the net GHG or vehicle miles traveled assessment of this service. But I think, you know, overall what you see from this, uh, you know, this initial study that we're reporting on today is a very encouraging um, sort of indicator about the fact that this will actually reduce um, the number of vehicles that people own. And the number of vehicles that you own is sort of the greatest indicator of how many vehicle mile travel you consume, right? And what I think, um, what the study uh, researchers found in this case was that in fact the, the presence and availability uh, of services like Lyft but also bike sharing and car sharing create this ecosystem that actually makes people more likely to use transit because when they give up a personal vehicle and maybe more importantly when they get out of the mode of just defaulting to their car as their main way of getting around, they become much more likely to engage in all these other sustainable modes as well. So the answer is, you know, we don't have all the answers yet because this is a new and evolving field. Uh, but I think there's much opportunity for future research, some of which is already being done, and, and we look forward to seeing the answers to those questions. And just to talk a little bit about kind of the efficiency argument. Um, there was a paper out today, or yesterday perhaps, by Alan Kruger at Princeton talking specifically to your point about the productivity and the efficiency of taxis on the road versus what they're able to see from Google vehicles on the road. So are they doing more trips per hour or are they busier as a share of the time on the road? In other words, for every vehicle mile travel that's being done through the Google platform, are you getting kind of more productivity and more efficiency from moving people around the city? And the evidence they have is the answer is yes. So I think it's worth checking that out if that's something you're interested in. But to Emily's point, I think there's a lot of questions that are out there that need to be answered. But we are collaborating with folks um, in the room on kind of studies to make sure about what that looks like. Yeah, particularly like the pooled ride services was a type of efficiency that was never able possible before through any of the prior services. So it's the you know single occupant vehicle use has been the primary mode of using the personal vehicle, but now with <laughs> Lyft Line and, and similar products, we are um, we're able to put you know four people in a vehicle. We have I think over 20% of all the matches that we create on Lyft Line at San Francisco now are triple matches. So we're achieving very high occupancy in those rides, and that that really helps the occlusion in terms of. Um, and, and in follow-up to your question on where's the additional data from the, the cities, you can find it in the online version of the report at APTA.com. And I think it's worth noting that five, five years ago, these two companies didn't exist. And so, and, and as you look at the evolution of how this interacted with transit, we're, we're kind of in phase three. Phase one was 
ignore them. They're out there doing their thing, they're doing our thing. Phase two was, oh my God, they're competitors. Talk to them. And phase three is, wow, we should collaborate and work together. And so we're early into that phase three. So we're starting at one level, as we're seeing, it's a it's a very dynamic ecosystem. And so there's a lot of different components. And so as this ecosystem evolves from its very uh, early stage in the growth curve, uh, we will start to evolve into more and more of those pieces and bring in more care trains and other complementary pieces. So great question there. Early in the process, lots of room to grow. And right now, starting out with a really good base of uh, opportunity. And we thank groups like the Ellis Island Coast and Dart for being first movers on this to help get us moving forward. Did I see another question over here Question for Brad. You mentioned or uh, the state legislature is full somewhere in the pilot or maybe in the broader scheme of things. Can you just say a little bit more about what that was and if others want to opine on um, the role of state legislature or other Sudan and with the National Governors Association. So we're interested in the role of state policy well, it's a great question and one that I ask my state government affairs folks every all the time is how this is uh, being viewed up in Tallahassee. Uh, certainly, as you like they know, and I think we move around the country, this is being debated in state legislatures. And uh, what we were able to position our, our pilot program is as a actual partnership, I think it was mentioned before, that we actually had Uber and taxi cab industry partnering together on this program and uh, that that is not something that is always heard in Tallahassee so well but since we have a we contract out our paratransit service we have really good relations with several cab companies in the area we were able to I could stand there together and then there was uh, uber and the cabs together shaking hands so it was, uh, I think that really helped us we do have of course there are some key leaders from our, the Tampa Bay area that are very, very uh, positive about this advanced mobility technology and want to see it happen. And, um, you know, they're really looking at this as a great, a great thing for their community. From a, like a state policy perspective, I think you, were, you raised a different question, which is sort of, what's the ability from your regional transit system to um, have fluidity of movement on these services across municipal jurisdictions? And so I think what you've seen now in, is it 30 or 31 states now that have enacted legislation for ride sharing pretty much just in the last two years. Um, many of them have been at the state level. Um, there are, there's certainly some city policies as well, but it's very helpful for um, allowing you know, something like a collaboration with a regional agency um, to happen when there's a uniform policy framework that, that cuts across a, a state. And so that, that's really been, I think, the trend recently. And to, it's very helpful in terms of speeding along um, the adoption, especially think about smaller communities. Think about you know the, the rural and suburban transit providers who may you know they might not be on their own sort of uh, capable of making a market in ride sharing. It's important for them that the state establishes those rules so that even small communities um, might you know may be able to benefit from that framework and attract um, these kinds of, of partnerships that can add mobility in their communities. And just to pull on that point of the state level. Uh, legislation that's been so important across the country. I think you could also, if you wanted to, we haven't done this explicitly, but tie an environmental efficiency argument back to that. Because if you know, individual town licensing requires people to kind of get that back to the town, if you open that up to a regional level, then you can get much broader efficiency and then, like, the side allow service to be kind of higher. We have two questions over here. One, two, one, two, three, and then four. And then we'll probably wrap up. So. Uh, Alex Beckham from Transportation for America. Thanks, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, just a question for Emily and Andrew. Uh, with regard to uh, using ride sharing and uh, kind of open transportation with the paratransit aspect, strategically, where do you see that evolving? Um, and what, what are the challenges that you're facing? I think I was talking to someone from Lyft at an event a couple weeks ago, and you know, um, uh, fixing vehicles or kind of modifying vehicles uh, to make them uh, uh, handicap accessible. Is a, is a big cost. Um, you know, one of the challenges is kind of the public-private partnership being able to do that. So, what are some other challenges in that field? And what do you see uh, that going on in the Yeah, the report did a great job of identifying some of the opportunities and challenges that exist in that space. But I definitely have to say, every time I meet with the transit agency, that is on the top of their list of things yeah. that they want to talk to us about. It's really is the original form of demand response transit, right? Where they're, it's been around for a long time. I mean, there's the dialer ride services, but certainly paratransit is where a lot of agencies are spending a lot of money right now to 
to provide service. And in many instances, I think they're starting to see that you know, they may have 50, 75 percent of their riders who actually could easily use a sedan vehicle like what is on the Lyft platform. And it's true that we have a challenge and that we're reliant on personally owned cars that everyday people have in their, in their driveways. So we don't have a fleet that we can bring to bear. In fact, in some jurisdictions, we're not legally permitted to have fleets. Um, so, but what we can do is really relieve pressure from those transit agency budgets by helping to most efficiently serve the trips that are well suited for um, for the Lyft platform. And I think there are all kinds of creative partnership models that are available potentially using our technology and other vehicle types. But we're just at the beginning of figuring out what those opportunities can be. Yeah, that's almost exactly what I want to say. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing I hear every time I go to any transit agency. But the paratransit comes like first and we're going to that as well. But also one of the places where we have So I think, like I said, there are many jurisdictions that are that are already supplemented the service. So it's not like we can be a brand new model of press or anything. Um, they there and they can use that as well as new services. So maybe there's some potential to build on existing models of the country. Uh, technology, the ability to kind of serve the audience and the official reason. Given all the interest on both sides, I'm sure there's other reasons. Hi, I have a couple of comments and a few questions. I'm Paul Vidar from the President of the Wisconsin Association of Taxi Cab Owners. Uh, we have 49 shared ride taxi systems in the state of Wisconsin that are locally controlled and do coordinate with their current transit entities. Uh, we understand that this is new technology, but we didn't have $30 billion to invest in creating our own apps. Uh, and we're very afraid that people with local jobs are getting place, displaced by uh, the fleets that come in from Chicago and Minneapolis and other cities that uh, are taking away local jobs and taking revenues out of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, it's something that people don't very often talk about. And we're also getting a lot of Uber and Lyft drivers that are trying to be full-time drivers that come to us because they can't afford to stay in business. Because they're taking the full burden of their vehicle maintenance, maintenance, their commercial insurance costs, and all the other costs that are associated with being a professional driver upon themselves. Uh, and the returns on the, the rides aren't sufficient to sustain them. Uh, beyond that, we are subject to FTA regulations and have to go through a lot of train programs uh, and it's in the interest of the public good for the safety and security uh, and consumer protection. Uh, I don't want to drag the mood down here, but there's been plenty of incidents that relate to consumer protections where uh, there hasn't been the oversight necessary. And it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. I, I think your data is a little bit short-term, and I don't know about your sample size. I think, it, I think it would have to be a little bit larger to call us a conclusive uh, decision on this study. Um, but we are trying to advance our systems. We are trying to create shared rides uh, already, but we're afraid that we're going to be competing for smaller pieces of the federal pie, and that it's going to go to these large corporations that are going to come in and say that, well, yours are employees, yours are currently not. So that's very confusing. So I think that there was a decision that Lyft drivers are Lyft employees, but you should treat them like employees. How are they going to get the training? How are they going to, how are you going to make sure that they have insurance? How are you going to make sure that you know who is actually using the application because I can pass my cell phone to them. Yes. Um, and you raised some points, so I'd like you to respond to that aspect of the ones that relate to this study, but I'm also looking for it um, getting into some dialogue afterwards, right? So that I saw Art taking down a lot of good notes on this, um, our policy person from AFTA, but I want to focus on this aspect and come back to some of these. Yeah, I think I look more deeply into those. There's 5,000. I live in Brooklyn. There's 5,000 drivers at, right now who are active with Uber. We live in the neighborhood. I'm a driver. I do what's called Uber. Right. So I think on the local jobs argument, I think there are places all across the country where we're seeing similar results. In fact, I think we're seeing exciting uh, potential for economic opportunities in places that didn't previously have it. So I think that's something we're pretty proud of. Trust them. Um, to answer kind of safety and security pieces, I think we have. You know, we're, we're proud of the background checks that we have and we operate. And I think what we have, it's never been possible before that we're exactly 
is you know accountability and feedback from the rider on every single trip. Right. So I think that's something that was never possible um, before the advent of smartphone, which made it super easy to collect. I think that combination uh, with the checks that we do beforehand are kind of the new frontier of, of how transport systems operate. Right. I worked in public transportation before. If you want to do a survey on every single rider on the bus, that'd be a huge logistical challenge. So I think a couple of those points are pretty exciting. So I think that takes on a couple of that. I can all say I think um, this is a really exciting time for all of the shared mobility. And taxis are a form of shared mobility. And I think that there is an opportunity there for all of the players in you know, traditional industries and new industries to embrace technology. I put in what you said you were you know, really doing that you know, with your operators in, in Wisconsin. I think that that's starting to happen in more and more jurisdictions. It's hard to turn yourself from an operations fleet company into a technology company. Um, but we're starting to see really interesting, you know, not just us, but I think the whole industry as a whole, is seeing taxi technology moving forward, providing service to people through apps, really adapting to consumer demands. And to the extent that that's the approach, I think that uh, you, there's certainly a place in the market for all kinds of different shared operators. Because really what this study showed was that it's an ecosystem that matters. It's not one provider. It's not Uber versus Lyft versus taxis. It's, it's all of these options, and all of us are working together to make it less necessary for people to own cars. And if you look at the percentage of the people who you know, did anything other than their driving, in any place other than New York City maybe, um, those were small percentages. And we all have an opportunity to grow the market that we serve um, to really adapt into what consumers are telling us about the way that they want their rights. We had one question over here, and the last question is up um, so Brad, you, you touched a little bit on the digital divide of some of the residents um, in your program who don't have smartphones, um, and sort of just said that, oh, they will have smartphones, um, but which is perhaps fair enough, but I wonder if Andrew or Emily actually could, could address this, and if maybe there's some alternative um, um, interventions to that down in the pipeline, and that what just came to mind was just perhaps like alternative interfaces, um, like a communal interface. Um, screen and I suppose in a low lower income area with a critical mass or higher density to allow it you know, rather than and perhaps actually alternative subsidy programs through a housing association um, I don't know something like someone like enterprise community partners or something. but just how, how do you actually tackle that and from a public policy perspective it seems like that um, something would need to be done rather than just say that you know the beneficiaries of this are just the ones that have smartphones to receive a, a, a rebate or a subsidy to get to trend, public transit. So but I wonder from the provider side if they can. So we actually we have some, I think they're promising opportunities to keep from this because um, we recently put out a product called Concierge, which is basically a dashboard for an organization or an agency that wants to dispatch rides on behalf of someone else, someone who doesn't have a smartphone, and they're able to do that from a central call center. So if they, you know, if the agency establishes a relationship with us, then they can take a call from someone who needs a ride for their dialer ride service. We're doing it right now with the non-emergency medical transportation providers um, in New York City, where we've been piloting it and expanding that. And um, that allows someone to call in, have a vehicle be dispatched to them without them needing a lift account at all, and have that relationship, um, you know, with with the agency to facilitate that. So I think those kinds of solutions that don't rely on people having smartphones, uh, even though they may not be used by a majority of riders, I think the majority of riders still will now and increasingly soon have smartphones. Transit uh, is a service that must be available to the least of others. And that's a you know, sober responsibility that I know you all take very seriously. And so we, we want to be adaptive to that. We want to create solutions that allow pathways for, for those riders as well. I think just to build on that, I think what's exciting is for things like an open API, which we've had for a while, that allows people to build new interfaces for requesting users to do all kinds of things. So they build a web-based interface, if you don't have a smartphone, there are people who specialize in making um, interfaces easier for senior citizens who haven't used smartphones before. But there's a thousand different ways now that we're trying to make it possible for you to be able to work, not always through a smartphone, not always through our app, and through uh, third party applications. I think that's, that's one piece that's not the whole solution. I think they always uh, have to get more and there's more to come. And I'll just jump in here real quick, Donna, and I'll see you in um, um, There's a program actually that HUD is doing for the very first time. It's called Connect Labs, where they're really talking about bringing technology to some of the most underserved under um, served communities. Um, and actually, you mentioned digital divide, which I think is interesting because if you think about it, we used to hear those words all the time. We don't hear them that much anymore because most people are migrating to smartphones now. So 
so I think that where, where you're going with that, those kind of projects that are already out here where people are helping to fund those, get behind those and let's see if we can get those expanded. But I do just want to touch on that. Could you mention very quick points? So thank you. We have a question here. Um, number three from um, IT Orlando, the Transportation for Senior 60 Plus. Um, it's definitely one of the sectors that I'm most impassioned by because seniors are typically those that use the paratransit and transportation disadvantage. Utilization, unfortunately, of the technology is not always, and I'm very encouraged by what you've just said, that there is a dialogue and so forth. We would like to think that with IT in Orlando, some of the things that we have done in the past have mirrored, and we have independent truck contractors that help, as well as volunteers that interface. So it's definitely a wonderful synergy that's happening that maybe some of those that are out in the volunteer sector would even like to plug into uh, potentially. My question is your demographics. Did it take in consideration that one in every five people in the next, by 2030, is going to be 60 plus? And as they continue to age, unfortunately, their ability to drive does go to the paratransit industry. So could you give me some demographics potentially that might be central? Um, well, in terms of the demographics of the study, the, the uh, surveys were distributed by transit agencies and also by some shared mobility providers, car sharing and bike sharing providers. So the, um, the overall demographics were, you know, reflect the passengers that were, that were surveyed. Um, and it was a little bit older than, um, uh, you know, there was a range because especially the transit users, um, there was a wider range of uh, ages. But certainly the section of the report that is about air transit, and as I said before, I mean, that was really the biggest takeaway for us as doing the study was there are just huge opportunities in the paratransit sector and there's lots of, of broad ways to define paratransit and, and to utilize the technology, both of the microtransit providers that, um, that are able to optimize rides and, and, and do a lot of routing, as well as um, the, what you all do with being able to um, you know, respond to the request for a ride quickly, that really can change the way that transit operates. If I could quickly add, um, I think there's an opportunity that's very important for us in the current 2016 right now to have an option for seniors, which my community has quite a few of, and, and everyone, and the opportunity that is there right now is called a cab. I mean, the, the taxi cab option, it was very important for us to have both these new technologies and the taxi. Taxi does have, have benefits that Uber that does not have. You can pay cash to the driver. You can talk to, um, you can call a telephone number and, and uh, book your trip. So th there, there are opportunities. I, I think that it's great that new things will be happening, but there's opportunities right now that these things can work. And, and to your point, and, and then um, we actually have to be out of the room by a certain time, so I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to cut off the debate, but um, we have we have a drop dead, get out, or they're going to turn the lights out on this kind of thing, so we're supposed to wrap up by 4.15 so they can come in and set up. But to your point, I raised this earlier, um, having a senior at home with being 95, and so when you're on Medicaid and Medicare and you're calling for a doctor's appointment, you have to call a week in advance. Well. No offense, 95, she has to see the doctor tomorrow. I want to, I honestly want to be able to do this and know that, okay, her appointment is scheduled, I got a text message, I know they're going to pick her up. So I, I raised that earlier that I think there are some growth opportunities here if you really think about the baby boomers um, and those who just can't drive for disability and mobility issues. And so I still think that there's some great opportunities here for moving into the future. Um, I want to highlight um, uh, Marlene uh, Connor, can you, who, who's been jumping at the business. Marlene, can you stand up? Okay. Marlene is like the queen of mobility management for us at AFTA. I mean, really, this is something that she's been working on for a very, very long time. And she's probably the happiest person in the room today. But I wanted to, to just acknowledge, Marlene, the work that you've done with AFTA over the years on this. We really appreciate your leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you.